Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Pringle. I have 17 years of experience in premium transit um, and specifically focusing on premium transit and regional transit here in Tampa Bay. Um, currently, I am the consultant project manager for the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the goal of our uh, Citizens Academy here this afternoon is to talk about transit. Um, this is the fourth session in the Citizens Transportation Academy series. Uh, pre previously, there's been uh, forums or discussions about the roles and responsibilities of agencies within our region, the metropolitan planning process, as well as transportation project development. And transit is an element of all those items. So I'm happy to be here today to talk about transit. And we're going to walk you through sort of a basic introduction to several different types of transit modes. And I, and I want to call your attention specifically to this point. We are going to focus on how transit serves people, because that really is the distinguishing factor between all these different types of transit modes. So before we get started, I'm going to actually introduce uh, our guest speaker here this afternoon, which is Cassandra Borgers. Cassandra. Hello, uh, I'm Cassandra Borgers. I'm the Chief Development Officer for the Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority. Um, I've been there five years, and in my department, we handle planning, scheduling, non-financial statistics, and public engagement. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about PSTA as a member of all of the transit agencies and the service providers that you see on your screen. Nationally, we're considered a mid-size uh, agency. We have about 200 buses and about 40 routes that we serve our county with. Uh, we do have several routes that also go outside the county. The majority of our 600 employees are in operations, um, and we have one of the most streamlined administrative staffs uh, in the country. I'm delighted to be with Scott here today um, as we start to kick off the, the meat of this presentation. Thank you, Sandra. So as we go through and introduce you to each one of these different transit modes, I do want to make this point first and foremost. I think the easiest way to think about transit and transit service is to really correlate it to the roadway system. There's a lot of parallels there. You know, where you have local streets on the transit side, we have local buses. When you're looking at some of your arterials, for example, here in Hillsborough, Fowler Avenue is a good example of arterial. Now you're starting to look at more of what we call bus rapid transit. We're also looking at things when you're talking about, you know, sort of limited access and high capacity like our interstates. Now we're starting to talk about steel wheel solutions and commuter rail as well. And then again, we're going to talk about high speed rail, which is kind of that highest, most premium transit service available. So, and before I get too far, I think the important thing to note here too, when we're thinking about transit, is that just like your roadway network, it is a transit network. And there's no single answer because we're trying to serve multitudes of different types of trips and multitudes of different purposes. So it has to be a network. We have to understand who we're trying to serve. And it really takes all these different transit modes working together to have the most efficient transit system for Tampa Bay. So on the website, there will be a brochure available. Uh, we're calling this our transit mode primer. So today, this afternoon, as Cassandra and I go through the individual transit modes, we're going to be talking in more generalities, but there's a lot of detail in that primer. So please go to the website, download that primer. And there's going to be a lot of information, both in the primer and what we're talking about today. So as I go through and as Cassandra goes through each one of these slides, please take note of these icons. You know, we have an icon with the, with the little people up there in the top left-hand corner where we're talking about, you know, how many people does this transit mode move per hour? So what is the capacity of that transit system? We also have information about how fast on average these different transit services uh, uh, generally operate at. And, you know, another really important part of the transit conversation is how much space does that transit service need? especially when you start looking at some of those transit services that need its own right of way. That becomes particularly important. So keep an eye on those icons. You're going to see them on each slide as we walk through each one of the modes. And to kick us off here, we're going to start talking about rubber tire transit. Um, and Cassandra is actually going to come up and walk us through some of those rubber tra transit type of services. Cassandra. So what you see up on the screen right now is our local bus. 
Um, this is primarily what we operate here in the Tampa Bay area. It has very frequent stops, sometimes can be 700 to 1,000 feet apart, and local buses can come as frequently as three minutes, but in our area, they more frequently come 30 minutes or 60 minutes, and in some cases, 120 minutes apart. Um, depending on um, what kind of trip you are taking, um, you would most likely use this kind of service for a shorter trip, connecting your neighborhood to a major destination uh, like, your, like your job. Um, for the next mode of express bus, we do have at least two uh, services that PSTA runs, our 100X and our 300X, that are express services to Hillsborough County. These have frequent stops at the beginning of the service, frequent stops at the end, but generally uh, are, are running with the traffic um, free freestyle um, but in between. Um, this generally serves commuter trips. As we start to get into more premium services, uh, we'll take a look at bus rapid transit. Uh, this can run in mixed traffic or a dedicated right of way and is generally used for high capacity corridors. The stop spacing is a little further apart, um, can be a quarter mile, a half mile, or in some cases, a mile uh, and usually can can accommodate a longer trip. For more advanced bus rapid transit projects, they will have a dedicated right of way. This allows the uh, the bus to run free of congestion um, and allows us to have a more substantial trip in terms of the frequency as well as the reliability of the service. Um, for more advanced projects like this one, you will have stops that are more like stations, the vehicles could be 40 foot, they could be 60 foot articulated vehicles, and you may have off-board fare collection. We'll let Scott get into some more of the other technologies. I think, Sandra, if you don't mind, you know, that, that uh, comment you made about off-board fare collection is an important part of bus rapid transit. Mm -hmm. Would you mind explaining that a little bit further? So one of the things that saves us time when we provide services is being able to do some things outside the bus. So right now, most of our local services, the fare is collected as people get on the bus. And so if somebody's fumbling with change or they're trying to tap their, their card with our new uh, Flamingo smart card, um, they may have a line behind them. When you have um, an off-board fare collection, people can get on more quickly, and that allows us to spend less time at the stations and more time on the road. So the next item we're going to talk about is also in that rubber tire category, and it's something that I've personally been very interested in, especially over the last couple of years, and it's really where we've seen a significant growth in technology. So what we're talking about is driverless transit. Um, we have a number of examples of driverless transit throughout the country on the rail side. Uh, for example, a lot of examples are, you know, are connecting our airports. Uh, we actually have an example of an, uh, a driverless transit vehicle here in Tampa Bay, and it's at the airport, and it's actually rubber tired, and it's connecting you between the different terminals. The greatest advance in the last couple of years in this technology on the driverless transit side has been in what we call sort of the smaller rubber tire solutions, and you can see a number of those pictures here. And really what we've seen over the past couple of years is, you know, our first and second generation driverless uh, buses or rubber tire transit solutions, um, we're carrying about 12 to 15 people per vehicle and they're going on an average uh, top cru cruising speed of about 25 miles per hour. And those pictures are the top two that you see on the screen here. The bottom left picture is actually that vehicle I talked about that's operating at Tampa International Airport. But I do want to call your attention specifically to the bottom right-hand corner picture. This is what we're calling a third-generation driverless uh, rubber tire solution. And the difference here is you know, advances in battery technology and systems and communication, which is allowing that vehicle to carry more people. So now it's carrying between uh, 15 up to 20 people per vehicle with a top cruising speed of almost 40 miles per hour so you can see as the technology advances what some of those applications may be here for Tampa Bay. So that really rounds out our um, uh, rubber tire categories. I'm going to start walking you through, through some of the other modes. Uh, first up is water transits or ferries commonly uh, called. A lot of people use the word ferry, not water transits. 
but what you're going to see on a, a ferry system or a waterborne transit, it's a unique service. It's point to point. You're going from a dock to another dock, like we have here in the Cross Bay Ferry in, in the bay connecting the downtowns between Tampa and St. Pete. And what that means is that you're not picking up passengers between those points. And that's something to really you know, be aware of and take consideration of. And then when you get to those docks, whether it's downtown St. Pete or what have you, you have to have a lot of local transit service or other transit services connecting to that dock to make sure you can get people around to their eventual destination. So we talked about the you know, requiring of docks. Usually they're you know, several miles apart. They can be you know, two to three or you know, several miles more than that apart. And one thing to note, it, is, it can be affected by weather. So that's part of the consideration moving forward. The next is elevated transit or aerial propelled transit. This is generally a transit vehicle that's suspended from a cable operating between different points. It's very similar uh, to water ferry for, for the simple point that like water ferry, it's really focused on point-to-point uh, -point travel um, and you aren't necessarily having a number of stations between your start and ends. Um, and realistically, a lot of the applications for air propelled transit is when we have a, a significant natural barrier. For example, a mountain or a, a extreme elevation that just really makes it difficult for other types of transit to traverse where this does a very good job of handling steep inclines. So now I'm going to start talking about steel wheel solutions. Uh, this are different types of rail solutions. They're operating on a fixed guideway. And just like the rubber tire, you can see a variety of different uh, uh, vehicles that are serving a variety of different needs. So again, just like the rubber tire, we're going to start talking about local service and move our way up to more regional service. And the first is the streetcar. We have a great example of a heritage streetcar here in Tampa. It's the Tico, uh, uh, Tico streetcar line that connects Ebor to downtown Tampa. That is a heritage streetcar system. Now, with streetcar systems, what you're going to find is they have very frequent stop spacing, so more of an urban environment where they're stopping every other uh, couple of blocks. Um, and they're serving, like I said, those short trips, those local trips. And most often, you're going to find streetcars operating with other vehicles. So it's in the same lane as other people are driving, and it's mixed with vehicles. Um, our example uh, in connecting Ebor to Tampa actually is separated to the, to the side of the travelways. Um, but a lot of the conversation, or a lot of the focus around looking at streetcar systems and rail as, as, in general is that it's a great way to start to sort of shape and encourage uh, development in your urban areas. So the next is modern streetcar. Um, this is very similar to streetcar in the fact that you're focusing on uh, you know, uh, shorter stops, but now you're looking at a vehicle that's larger in nature, it has greater capacity to move people, and it does move faster than your heritage streetcar. So while it is st we're still looking at a station spacing that's between a quarter mile to a half mile apart, it is faster, and it does carry more people, so it's serving both those short trips in the urban environment, but also some of those longer trips, and it could operate in two different ways. It can have its own right away, so not with it with traffic itself, or like this picture shows, again, operating in the street with other vehicles surrounding it. Now, light rail is very similar to light uh, to modern streetcar, and to be exact, um, the vehicle itself may be identical. So a modern streetcar could use the exact same vehicle as a light rail system, but the difference here is that almost always you're going to find a light rail system operating in its own right-of-way. And this allows it to get out of traffic, to bypass that congestion, and because of that, again, you're getting even, even faster speeds between those station areas, which could be anywhere between a half mile to a mile apart. And now, you're, again, you're starting to move away from just serving those local trips, more focusing on those medium length trips. So, you know, on average, three to five miles uh, trip. And again, like I said before, you know, it could be a very similar vehicle, but it's going to be operating in its own lane. Now, paired streetcar, modern streetcar, and light rail, 
They are all powered, generally speaking, by a catenary system. So you can see those overhead wires in this picture here. That's where it's drawing power. And that's sort of part of how we uh, you know, uh, categorize this family of uh, steel wheel solutions. Scott, before you move on to other kinds of rail, um, can you talk a little bit about the different sizes of these vehicles and how they would operate um, in downtown streets? Yeah, absolutely. And Sandy, please jump in if you feel. Um, you know, Harris Streetcar is going to be generally one vehicle that's carrying what between 50 to maybe eight, you know, around 50 people per vehicle. When you look at modern streetcar, now you're starting to uh, you have a much longer vehicle itself. Um, and, and a good thing, and I think we talked about this yesterday, is the fact that you know the length of the vehicle. You have to really keep that in mind because, you know, we're talking vehicles that could be 200 feet in length, which may actually start to block traffic at stations, especially when you're in a tight urban area. But again, when you're you're definitely looking at increasing the length of the train, starting with Heritage, going to modern streetcar, and light rail being usually the longest, where you can couple multiple cars together. And you're and you can see here by the icon, you know, on the top end, now you're moving quite a few people per hour, you know, up in that 7,000 uh, person per hour range. So the next group of uh, steel wheel solutions, again, you know, the way it draws power tends to sort of group it as a family of rail solutions. And you'll notice here on these slides, and we mentioned a couple of times, that a lot of these systems are actually drawing power from what we call a third rail. So in this picture here, if you look at where the train is operating, you can see the two steel tracks and then the lighter silver track to the right hand side. That is actually the power source in which the train is drawing power from. And because of that, it requires that you protect that right of way because we don't want people entering into the space for safety reasons, whether it's coming in contact with that third rail or obviously coming in contact with the train. So that's an important consideration when we're looking at heavy rail because it needs a lot more space. You need that space to make sure it's clear of any obstacles. It does uh, need greater space to make turns because these trains themselves can be easily, you know, eight to nine to 10 to 12 plus cars in length. They're moving a significant amount of people per hour. And really a lot of these heavy rail solutions like the picture you see here are operating in our, our some of our most dense urban areas in the country. Um, you know, a great example, uh, MARTA actually is an interesting example here in uh, Miami-Dade. Uh, that's also considered heavy rail while it's elevated. But some of the more traditional systems like you see in New York or in Chicago, that's heavy rail, right? And it's moving a lot of people per hour. Now, it's very similar to heavy rail that's at grade, like those uh, major metropolitan systems that I just mentioned. You can also look at elevated rail. So you're basically taking a similar platform, but because you have to have that protected space to keep people out of the running way itself, now you can actually elevate that and put it on structure to help you create that separation, to help you provide, you know, create that, that protected right of way and ensure safety. This example here uh, is actually operating on one rail. You can see the single rail there, as well as the gray strips or in the, the cable. I don't know if you can see that at the bottom. That's the power source. But one rail, mono rail, and that's where the term comes from. So instead of operating on two rails, it's operating on one rail. This example here is actually in Las Vegas, but I think a lot of people here in Florida, you know, immediately go to the Disney example, which is also a monorail system. But just like heavy rail, you can add several cars to the train. You can, you can scale the, the, the size of the train to meet the demand that you have at hand. Uh, and you can really move quite a few people per hour using uh, these heavy rail systems. The next is commuter rail. Uh, now, commuter rail, while it's in sort of the heavy rail category, it doesn't draw power from a third rail. This, however, is actually uh, uses a diesel locomotive to move the train itself. And generally what we're seeing on the commuter rail side is that you've got stations that are quite a few miles apart, you know, five plus miles apart, and it's really connecting those sort of 
key intermodal centers or key uh, city centers with your greater community, the suburban neighborhoods. Um, and it's designed to just do that. It carries long distance trips. Um, and it does have the ability to add cars on, just like heavy rail, so you can move quite a few people per hour, but it is specifically designed to handle commuter service. So you're talking about moving people back and forth on a daily basis to work, and what you're going to find on the service side is, generally speaking, you're going to see a, you know, trains operating during that morning rush hour or that evening rush hour, really focusing on getting people back and forth to work. You know, we have some great examples across the country of commuter rail, uh, Long Island Railroad, Metra in Chicago, but also this picture here is SunRail actually here close to us in Orlando. The next example uh, is high-speed rail. Now, when we start talking about high-speed rail, we're actually starting to sort of migrate out of the traditional rail sort of category or family of solutions. And the best way I can sort of put this is that when you think about high-speed rail, it's almost like inter-regional flight travel. You're really talking about making you know, a long trip, connecting these long distances, almost like as if you were going to take a flight from Tampa to Miami. You know, high-speed rail can fit that same niche. You know, you're really talking about, you know, connecting major city centers within a state. Um, and as the name implies, you know, the vehicles themselves can cover those distances because they're going quite fast. But it does that by using the propulsion itself. But, it, you know, its stations are easily, you know, 15, 20 to 30 miles apart, allowing it to get up to speed and get that sort of uh, travel time convenience. Um, you know, a really good way to think about high-speed rail, and there's examples, obviously, uh, you know, most of the examples come from Europe or Asia, but, you know, a great example of high-speed rail is connecting London to Paris. So think about that trip, right, where, you know, that's the type of trip that high-speed rail is really designed to serve. So probably as important, if not the most important element of transit that tends to really get overlooked uh, uh, is the stations themselves. This is the point in which people access transit, and it is incredibly important to an efficient transit system. And the reality is, is we have a, the ability to, you know, implement a variety of different sizes and scales of stations, and it should be designed to serve the people who are using the system. So you can have, you know, as Cassandra mentioned, you know, talking about some of the local bus service, like where you just have a shelter in place, or you can have, you know, stations that range in size and amenities, you know, up to this next example, which is a traditional sort of uh, park and ride station. Now, this intermodal station itself is going to have amenities for the users. You can see the rail connection here, but it's also that point of access between your entire transportation network. You can see the parking there in the background that allows people to either drive to the station, to use the transit service. You can see in the foreground the buses that are making connections to that rail service. And it also provides you the opportunities for that sort of uh, first and last mile connection, whether it's, you know, today it's the Ubers or the Lyfts dropping you off or maybe it's your wife or whatever dropping you off at the station in the morning uh, so that you can transfer to the transit network and, and go about your journey. So this is sort of in the middle between a shelter and the larger intermodal centers that have those big footprints. This is more of a community uh, transit station example. And I think the important thing to talk about here is how it can sort of be a focal point for a neighborhood or for a community. And really, you get to see a lot of growth and economic development coming occurring around these stations, whether it's shops or jobs or what have you. And a lot of it is you know, connecting to that pedestrian network, because the truth is, when you're using transit, you're a pedestrian first before you even get on that vehicle, whether it's a bus or a train. And now you've got an opportunity to be attracted into shops along these stations so you can start to see how, you know, connecting into a complete streets network, connecting these stations into the fabric of a neighborhood can be such an important part of the conversation when we're looking at transit service. One thing that we don't want to forget to mention, um, and it's a critical piece of any transit service, 
uh, is the maintenance facility itself. So the size of the maintenance, maintenance facility is dependent on the service that you're providing uh, and the number of vehicles that you're serving. Uh, but, you know, and, and there's a lot of conversations right that, around that because if you have a large fleet of buses or trains that need to be uh, stored and maintained and serviced, you're going to need a pretty decent footprint to have those uh, maintenance barns. And this here is just a quick picture, sort of showing some creativity and how you can implement a maintenance facility, where this is actually a streetcar barn that's actually under an interstate. So with that, I'm going to actually move and, and introduce and bring, ask Cassandra to come back and join the conversation because you know we actually have this fantastic opportunity that's occurring that it's an application of just one of these modes that we've been talking about, and it's a key transit project uh, for Tampa Bay that is moving towards implementation. Thanks, Scott. This is probably my favorite part of the presentation because I get to talk about project that is actually moving forward. Um, our bus rapid transit project um, that we recently submitted to the Federal Transit Administration um, is designed to connect downtown St. Petersburg uh, to the Gulf Beaches. Um, it will stop um, along the way um, with 17 stops in this 11 mile service and will use 60 foot articulated vehicles. Um, I want to give thanks to the Florida Department of Transportation, the City of St. Petersburg, and the PSTA Board uh, because we, because of their partnership, we have the state and local funding that we can use to apply for federal funds. Um, so understanding that that they are matching our funds in this project. Some of the features that we'll have um, in this project include some off-board fare collection. We'll have branded vehicles, so be a service unique to this corridor. Um, the stations will be designed uh, uniquely for the project, um, and we'll have some designated lanes uh, for portions of the bus travel. So it'll be a semi-exclusive business access and transit lane, um, and what that means is we will allow automobiles to make turning movements in the bus lane. What this does is it makes our traffic impacts minimal, if, if maybe non-existent. Um, but I, I want to make sure that people understand that, that this project is part of a larger system plan that we have and that the region has. Um, the Central Avenue corridor happens to be the higher, highest ridership corridor in the region and certainly in our county, and that is why we're starting with it first. But where we go from here as a region depends on what comes out of the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan, uh, which is being managed by Scott. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, just before I start talking about the Regional Plan itself, uh, please go to the website for the, the community uh, to be next website because we do have that transit primer brochure that I mentioned up front. Um, you know, and I know we went through each one of those modes today, but there's a lot of detail in there. So if you have any questions about any of the modes that we talked about, please go to that brochure and it's going to provide you a significant amount of detail. So as Cassandra mentioned, you know, where do we go next and how do we create that transit network that I talked about up front and how do we create that for Tampa Bay? Uh, my job specifically um, is to identify a premium transit project for Tampa Bay. And by premium transit, I'm talking about a transit service that for the most part is hopefully operating in its own lane and avoids that traffic congestion that we know and experience on a daily basis and connects our region quickly and efficiently. Now, when we talk about building premium transit for Tampa Bay, how do we do that? How do you go about identifying and building premium transit? The truth of the matter is we have to answer three simple questions in order to get that job done. First and foremost, we have to know what is the project to be built? What is the most effective, highest performing project that we can start off with here in Tampa Bay? The second is how is that project funded? And then who is responsible for maintaining and operating that service? Now, my mission under the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan is to primarily focus on answering question number one. What is that project? What is that top performing project? And exactly how much do we think that project is going to cost? So we have a, a number of different steps in the development of the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. 
the first year of the plan itself is focused on identifying and working through the technical aspects of the plan. We have a number of different steps involved in that. And then when we get to January of 2018, we're actually going to come out with a draft plan of how to build out all the different transit projects that we're identifying here in this vision. Um, and we're going to actually have a community vetting process from January right through September of 2018, where everybody in the community can come out and give us this their thoughts on all aspects of this of this transit vision. So the transit vision, it was our job and our goal for step one in the regional transit feasibility plan to figure out as a region, what are the types of service that we need? And based on the, all the technical information that we have, you can see the network here. And when you start looking at this network, which includes a variety of services, everything from 54, 56 in Pasco County, US 19, I-275, even connections to South County, what we see the benefit of this vision of this transit network for Tampa Bay is that by 2040, we're going to serve six out of 10 jobs in 2040. And when we're talking about our residents and our population, we're going to serve half of our population by 2040 within a half mile of this network. So as you can see, this vision is really important to Tampa Bay and it really has an amazing amount of benefits um, for, serving, uh, for serving our region. Now that was the outcome of step two, which we concluded in the June timeframe of this year. We just finished up step two here in October, and that was starting, starting to focus on, okay, well, we know where this vision is. We know where some of those top performing connections are, but what is the top performing projects that may be sort of the starting point for building this vision? So as you can see here, the darkest lines within the vision network really identify what we're finding out is sort of that top performing project. And that's really connecting Wesley Chapel to USF, Tampa, Gateway and St. Petersburg, um, as well as looking at another connection uh, from downtown Tampa to USF. And we're actually evaluating a number of those modes that we just talked about. We talked about the rubber tire, bus rapid transit, the driverless uh, bus vehicles, we talked about steel wheels. So when we're looking at those top projects, we are evaluating here through January, what can we do for light rail in these corridors? What can we do for commuter rail in these corridors? What can we do for bus rapid transit? What can we do for some driverless vehicles? And that's all gonna be part of the conversation that we're having starting now in October and we'll continue through January at which point we're going to come forward with information about how to phase these projects over time. So how do we build all the projects that we're identifying in this transit network and how do we prioritize them? Where do we start and where do we go next? That'll be a big part of our conversation in January. So Cassandra, we'll talk a little bit about the hardest thing to do in transit, which is fun. <laughs> I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up here. We, we, we've talked a lot today about some major projects and some opportunities that we have. Um, next week's session, we'll get into more detail about funding in general, but we wanted to wrap up today's session uh, with some basic information about transit funding. Um, so I'm just going to focus a little bit on how major capital investment projects get funded. Um, there are many local sources that are needed to operate the service, um, but one of the things that, difference, that is different about uh, transit capital funding um, is that it is largely discretionary um, at the federal level. Um, so which means that you have to compete for it. And uh, generally the uh, federal government will give you half of the capital that you need if you come to the table with the other half. Here in the state of Florida, we are very fortunate that the Florida Department of Transportation has its own state program to bring back those federal dollars. So for every dollar that a local agency or authority uh, puts into a project, the department will match that one for one, understanding that those $2 together then uh, match $2 on the federal side. So making it a 50% a federal, 25% state, and 25% local share. Um, and like I said, this is not the case in all states. Many agencies have to come up uh, with their entire local share. And for us in, in Pinellas County, we also have some of our local share uh, coming from uh, our local cities. And Cassandra, if you don't mind, um, when we're talking about those discretionary funds, how <laughs> difficult is it actually to get federal funds from, from the capital investment program? Well, certainly a process. Um, and you have to make sure that you have a well-developed project 
not only that competes well technically, but then also has this federal federal share, um, sorry, this financial side. So the, the project development process, I think they went through some of that last week with uh, the NEPA, but in, on the transit side, um, it takes a couple years to design your project, sort of in, in a preliminary phase. For larger projects, you may then have a separate design phase, and then you have a construction phase. So for a project like ours, um, with the BRT, we've just uh, spent about 18 months <coughs> developing that project. Um, we have now submitted it to the federal government uh, for their rating. Uh, we will try to get into the fiscal year 19 budget, which means we not only have to have that technical ability for that project to compete, but then we also have to work with um, our congressional delegation to make sure that that, that project gets into the, into the budget. So we're looking at a construction period of 2019 um, with operations in 2020. So we started in at the end of 2015 and will be operational in 2020. And it's a, and it's a pretty simple project in terms of being BRT and not rail. And I think the, the thing you mentioned about being in the, the funding cycle, the funding program, is that we're talking about congressional budget cycles. So it's literally an act of Congress to get your money approved for a transit project, which is very different than when you're, when you're having a conversation on the roadway side, where a lot of those federal dollars are actually uh, you know, delegated to the state to build the projects. Yeah, it's not a joke. It is no. an act of Congress. <laughs> So I think that with that, it sort of concludes our overview of transit and you know how to serve the different populations in Tampa Bay, uh, whether you're looking at local service, sort of longer distance service. Um, and with that, I think at this point, we're ready to go ahead and take some questions. Uh, the first question is, what role does ride share, like Uber and Lyft, play in transit? How does it affect the transit ridership? So the question is, how do Uber and Lyft integrate with the transit system? I think that's a great question. It's definitely something that Cassandra's been grappling with over the past year or so, or even longer. So PSTA is nationally recognized for our partnership uh, with Uber. Um, we have several mobility on demand programs uh, that we've been piloting in Pinellas County. One is our Direct Connect program, which is uh, related to that first mile, last mile. So we have uh, designated stops within our county uh, where people can access the bus system. And as long as they use Uber, United Taxi, um, or our wheelchair provider, um, we will pay the first $5 of their trip if their trip begins or ends at, at that designated transit stop. What this does for us is it makes for a more efficient first mile, last mile solution, but also allows us to reallocate, potentially reallocate funds for lower performing services to our core network. And so I think that there's an opportunity to put these new technologies in uh, with our system. Um, we still don't know what the impact is of these new technologies on our ridership, uh, though we do know that people having more flexibility does affect how people ride, uh, but we're hoping that we can be more partners with this new technology um, than adversaries. Yeah, absolutely. And we keep on mentioning first mile, last mile, because it's an, a critical component of any transit service. And, and, and what we're talking about there is the fact that you're not always going to have a station in front of your house. So how do you get from your home, from your front door to that transit station? And then again, you know, that's why it's such a big part of this, because it adds to that convenience so that people, you know, can make the transit system work for them on a daily basis. Next question. That kind of leads into another question about bike pet facilities in transit and how those are integrated. Are those necessary to be near a transit station? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it is scalable depending upon the service. Uh, but as I, you know, I mentioned in the presentation, you know, every transit trip starts as a pedestrian. So having connectivity to good sidewalk networks, having facilities, whether they're bike racks or bike lanes getting to the station are really important and really, again, makes that station part of the fabric of, of the community itself. And it's really critical to having a good transit system. I don't know if you want to add anything. Sure, and, and there is that the Federal Transit Administration will also allow you to put part of those facilities into your project if they are within a certain distance of the station. So I think it's, an, it's a recognized um, part of, of an entire project. And another question is, when would autonomous transit be ready for like real world use? 
well, that's, that's really exciting. <laughs> that's kind of exciting. Um, I know Scott's been doing a lot of research on that, uh, and and we have too. Um, Hart will unveil its autonomous vehicle program on Marion Street as part of the um, November, uh, I think it's autonomous vehicle symposium summit um, that's being held in downtown Tampa. So that's very exciting. That technology is moving so quickly that I think that we will see it sooner rather than later. Um, I think that we will need to do some things with our infrastructure, um, but we are also looking at um, a pilot project in downtown St. Petersburg, um, and we think that we can get that operational in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, yeah, like Sandra said, you know, I, it's very exciting. I mean, we've had demonstrations here in Channel Side. We've had demonstrations of the driver, driverless vehicles in Jacksonville. So obviously the technology is here already. It's just a matter of sort of continuing to roll out that, that service and really implement it. And, you know, I think what Cassandra mentioned, you know, we have to look at our infrastructure and make sure that we're building our infrastructure with the flexibility to take on these new technological technological advances, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, as we're adding facilities, maybe widening a facility, making sure that the communication systems are in place so that those vehicles can operate because they're highly dependent on communications between the user and the vehicle and the vehicle and the infrastructure itself. So again, it's very exciting times. And, you know, we're seeing the demonstration projects already. I think within, you know, three to five years, we're gonna see a full blown applications that are running, you know, on a daily basis. Yes, um, I just wanna add something because the thing that we haven't talked about is the parking side, and I think uh, transit, um, autonomous vehicles, ride share, the investment that we're making in our roadways, all of that is valid as part of the system. Um, I would be most nervous if I was a, a, a parking lot operator, um, because I think that's the piece of what we may not be thinking overall is how our land use changes because our cars will be on the road or the buses will be driverless we won't necessarily need to park. Absolutely. Um, Neil Cosentino with uh, Global Mobility Consortium. I have a couple of observations. Uh, first, I'd like to share the fact that um, Boeing and JetBlue are working with a designer. It's in the papers. It's out there. And they're building an electric airplane that will carry 12 passengers at eight cents a mile, okay? So that, and, and today uh, you're limited to 288 miles an hour below 10,000 feet. So if 12 people get on this airplane uh, at, at Lakeland and wanna go to Tampa or wanna go to St. Pete at 288 miles an hour at eight cents a seat mile, that's the future. And we're not seeing you could call it air transit uh, because the airplanes will get bigger and they'll carry more people. So uh, it's missing in there and it should be, uh, the question is, what is the seat cost per mile today? Okay, what is the seat cost per mile today on those X buses from uh, St. Pete to Tampa? You know, it's very difficult to, without having a specific service to talk to, because there's so many variables. You know, how many vehicles are operating per hour? How many people are using that system? So uh, it, it varies where you can have, you know, local services will have, and maybe Cassandra has some figures to sort of back me up here, but uh, it definitely is variable across the board. And, and to your point uh, with the advances in, in, in electric transport, propulsion as a whole, I think that's part of the conversation that we're having on the transit side and looking for some of the cost efficiencies when you're looking at all electric vehicles. But your point about air travel, you know, if somebody's going from Lakeland to Tampa, they're still going to need a transit system when they well, get to Tampa. There's so no question that last around, mile so is always going to be with us. Figures. But the, the, the point is that in the airline industry, okay, you measure efficiency of any system, and airlines are pretty complicated, okay, because they have so many variables, but they're all measured. Their efficiency is measured in seat miles, cost per seat mile, and we can't evaluate all these systems based on cost per seat mile because nobody provides it. So there has to, I'm hoping that the consultants so that the average person could understand. It's also, we understand that it's cost per seat mile when you buy a car. 
You know, so it kind of leads into you know, another question that we got about the, the cost differences in modes. Like, so when you showed local bus, express bus, rail, water ferry, are there huge cost differences in setting up a system according to mode, and are there any that are more cost efficient or better ROI than others? Yeah, I mean, there are there are cost differences um, in operations. I don't know. I mean, our our bus system, um, it does it. Some of it depends on what kind of vehicle you're running, you know, your your propulsion system, um, but your operations costs for rail are generally higher, but your return on them is also higher. Yeah, and I think you know, Cassandra and I, you know, struggle to put costs in, in general terms because there's so many variables, right? Every station has a cost. So how many stations do you have? That goes into your cost factor. How many trains or buses are you running? Each train has a cost. How many trains? I mean, so it's really difficult to talk about these things in generality uh, without actually having the specifics of the system itself. You give me the specifics of the system, I can give you all kinds of data about that. Well, it's just, but, look, if you run a bus once an hour, it's going to be more cost effective for you to do that than if you run a train once an hour. But if you right. are running a bus every three minutes, it may cost you less to run a train um, every 15 minutes, and you still have the same capacity. Right. But some general rules of thumb, I mean, when you're looking at local or express bus service, I mean, you're definitely talking, what, less than a million a mile easily, depending upon the system. Uh, BRT, whether it's in its own guideway or is in mixed traffic, can be anywhere between five million per mile. And we have some national examples where it's even on the high end, it's up to 30 million per mile. Uh, this is the difference between Scott and me, is that he was thinking about the capital and I was thinking about the operating. <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah. <laughs> like I'm, no, 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 it doesn't cost that much per <laughs> mile to operate. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> so the capital when, when you look at you know <laughs> things like light rail, commuter rail varies depending upon you know how much right away you need. If the right away is there, uh, commuter rail can easily be again between. You know, 10 million per mile on the really low side, but anywhere up to you know 50 to 60 million per mile. Uh, light rail, on average, can be anywhere between sort of 60, 65 million per mile up to 90 million per mile or higher. Uh, heavy rail can easily be in excess of 150 million per mile or even more expensive. You know, for example, I think uh, Second Avenue subway in New York was well over almost two billion dollars. Don't quote me on that number, but you're only you you did less than a mile, so you can see the difference in capital costs can be you know, immense when you're talking the difference between rubber tire and steel wheel, which is definitely your higher capital investment. Well, and all, all I, that leads into so uh, yeah. yeah. I'd like Just, to ask another question, okay. please. Um, why don't we have a regional bus system today? And that observation is based on uh, we have bus systems, we have the need, and it hasn't happened. So the question is, why didn't it happen? And then the next question is, how can it happen? And that's, that's not costing any money because if we regionalize our bus system, we create more mobility at less cost. And yet we haven't done that. So why is that? Well, the how, I'll answer the how, maybe Cassandra, the why. Um, <laughs> the how, I mean, that's what exactly we're talking about in the regional transit feasibility. That vision for Tampa Bay um, is something that's been uh, you know, on the tip of all the agency staff's tongues for years. I mean, look at that map, and it's very similar to a lot of efforts in the past. We, we know that. So we need to find a way to invest in that regional transit system itself. No, that, no we're talking about a bus system. It exists. All these bus systems exist. Bus, rubber tire and why the haven't they come together? What is the problem, and what is the solution? We need that. We do. Because that's the most, that. yep. that's the quickest thing you can do to create more mobility right. for people. And you're not, it's not happening. Why? Well, it also comes down, it definitely comes down to those three questions, right? There's that question of what do we have to do? That's and then I got my question. How do we how do we fund it and who owns it and operates it? Right? I can't I had those three questions. I mean, that's the key recipe to getting you can done on the transit side. So, you know, we have a really good sense of the project. It's just a matter of sort of building this coalition regionally 
to figure out exactly how we can invest in the, these regional transit services, buses included, as well as who's going to own it and operate. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. And historically, Tampa Bay has done a really poor job in investing <laughs> in its transit system. That kind of leads into another question about um, rail investment. Are the feds no longer investing in rail or what what's the thought on fixed guideway since all this new technology is coming in no they're the the the, the, the fta the federal transit administration their capital investment grant program which is generally called new starts or small starts um, uh, still is definitely including steel wheels part of the solution you know when we're looking at rail technologies you know they move a lot of people per hour so if you need to move a lot of people per hour, that's a good solution. And it's definitely still still part of the federal program as we move forward. Another question, if you don't go with rail, can you still get transit-oriented development with a rubber tire solution? That, uh, there are examples of seeing economic growth occurring around uh, rubber tire solution stations. Um, you know, I think the best rule of thumb when you're talking about transit and economic development is you're going to get that return on investment depending upon how much you put in. If you're investing in a significant station for, even if it's rubber tire transit, you're going to see that return in economic growth around that station. So it's all about, you know, what you invest into the network is going to really depend, it's going to be dependent on how much return you get out of that network. So if you're just looking at, you know, local service with shelters, you're not going to see that much economic growth because the investment is on the, the smaller side. But if you're looking at major intermodal centers, you're going to see a lot of economic return on that investment because it's a high investment area. Fixed. And anything that's fixed. So anything that has a fixed guideway, something that you, you make it really difficult to move, is going to generate more economic opportunity. So rail is, or even trolley wires, which can be rubber tire. Trolley buses are rubber tire, but they have that. They can. They have to run on that particular guideway. And so that's what makes that attractiveness to the station that is there because you can't easily move it. When you can easily move the, the solution, like autonomous vehicles, you know, who, that aren't in their own guideway or buses that aren't in their own guideway, that's that's when you have less of a return. Can you give examples of economic growth around rail, like what what it does for economic development? Oh yeah, I mean that picture that that. Um, Scott had up there about one of the transit stations, that was Plano, Texas. Um, and they have three-story apartment buildings in Plano, Texas, because they built a rail, rail station there. And they've seen um, incredible amounts of investment around their rail stations. Because of that public investment, they've seen a lot of private investment. I mean, to some degree, we could even talk about that investment here in Tampa, Tampa Bay. Tico Streetcar and Channel Side, and all the growth that's occurred around the Channel Side area. Another question was about communities that we can use as benchmarks for transit um, that are similar to us in terms of growing a new regional transit network. Is there anywhere else we can look at, for example? Well, I think it's, it's, it's the question is developing the projects. Absolutely. Um, it would be some, I would think, was you know, Phoenix, Dallas, Denver, Charlotte. Um, you know, some of those operate in high heat. Phoenix, like we do, um, Dallas, high humidity and, and high heat, um, Charlotte, a, a southern city. You know, there's, so there's all kinds of examples that we could use for that. Um, in terms of governance, um, I would probably, probably use some other cities as model as other models of how we can collaborate better. So I think those are maybe two different questions depending on where the that person was going. With that. Um, and could you talk about the effect that transit has on traffic congestion? Well, I think the important thing to know, it, it definitely will have an effect on congestion. And in, in, in the simplest way to describe it is you're providing people with options, right? You're taking a corridor, you're adding a new transit service, which in its own right has its own ca capacity. You now we had all those different icons on the slides where you were moving how many people per hour, you know, anywhere from 400 people per hour to 7,000 people per hour. That's adding capacity to a corridor, which provides those mobility options. So, you know, I think you know, the conversation really between transit and roadway needs to, we need to talk about that. It's not, we're not, as we move forward, 
I think for our region, for the nation as a whole, we need to stop thinking about roadway projects. We need to start thinking about mobility projects and looking at all the options that we have available to us and how best to serve everybody moving within that core. So the short answer that I have, and I know the, the DOT folks in the room will probably not like this, um, but uh, the short answer is yes. Okay, the short answer is that, that transit can relieve congestion, okay? The long answer is that you probably won't notice it, okay? Because we're adding capacity to the core. So think about your trip in the morning. Let's say you live in Wesley Chapel and you are trying to get to downtown Tampa. I'll bet you leave around 6.45 in the morning. Because if you leave at 7.45 or even 7.15 or sometimes maybe even 7.02, you know that you are going to get in this massive traffic jam coming into downtown Tampa. And so you choose to just spread your time a little bit more, a little bit differently. And so what happens is, what happens if, if a train is running from Wesley Chapel to downtown Tampa? Some people who don't want to be in that congestion anymore are going to get out of their cars and they are going to get on the train. And guess what? You will realize that you can leave at 7.15 now and get to work at 8 o'clock instead of leaving at 6.45. And so you will change your pattern. So what will happen is the spread of our rush hour will be determined on how many people are trying to get into one area and what that elasticity of their time value is. Was it not too bad, right? You're okay with that? <laughs> okay. Hey, that was the last question. Are there any other comments or thoughts you want to add? No, I, thank you yes, so much for you. the opportunity. Thank you to the Department of Transportation. Um, the DOT is always a good partner for us, and so we appreciate their time, attention, and most of all, their money. <laughs> thank you both. Great session. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's been watching. What I'd like to do is uh, invite everyone to please continue to join us for our, our webinar series. We have um, uh, two more webinar sessions. Uh, Next week, we'll be discussing, let me make sure, uh, how transit is the, the funding, the role of funding, and how transportation projects are funded. And uh, the, our next session actually will be on Thursday, November 2nd, and we'll be learning more about, uh, about the transportation processes. So uh, please join us. If you haven't been able to join us for one of our sessions, visit our website at tampabaynext.com uh, and in our uh, Get Involved under Citizens Transportation Academy, you will find a list of those sessions, uh, webinars that have been held, and you can watch them at your leisure. So we hope you'll join us next week, uh, Friday the 27th, again at 12 noon. Thank you so much for those that have joined us online as well as those that have joined us here today. Great day. <laughs>